Hey, good morning to so those of you on the West Coast. Good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. Nice sunny day out here for us before uh, Hurricane Nicole does whatever she does coming up the coast here. But it's all fun right now, so I'm happy about that. It's not overly windy. Looking forward to talking about how to find and win your next federal contract. It's a 30-minute training session, right? So the, uh, the information will be designed to be concise in there, but I'm going to give you three good tips. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, as we're waiting to get started here, I just wanted to uh, give those of you who are here early a little bit of, uh, you know, an extra tip, if you will. There's a book, Coach Wooden's Greatest Secrets. It looks like this. Um, and it's one of uh, the books that my friend Tim Kelly has let me uh, let me know about. I love it because it speaks uh, to what I think anyways. But this guy says it in so much better way. And he's and he spent a lot of time. But he focuses. He's a um, basketball coach. And he so he did a lot of coaching players on trying to help them see the little things. Don't worry about championship game. That'll take care of itself, but come back to the little things, which is what I talk a lot about. So, you know, as we're uh, ramping up today's training, I just wanted to read these eight chapter titles because they tell you a lot about what's in the book, right? Little things are fundamental to achievement. Little things lead to simplicity and success. Little things prepare you for great things. Little things are key to achieving your goals. Little things produce consistency. Little things lead to excellence. Little things guard your character and little things yield a habit of success. When you do the little things, um, it'll lead to the big things, right? And, and that's fundamental to everything I teach in these trainings is I don't try to teach some magic secret trick of how to succeed in the federal government space. What I try to teach is process that is basically just a bunch of little things done together will lead to big success down the road. And so I'm excited about that. Um, if you do not know who I am, my name is Neil McDonald. I am the president of the GovCon Chamber of Commerce, and I'm excited that you're here for today's daily LinkedIn Live federal sales training, also shown on YouTube and other places, um, where I teach process and procedures for success in the federal market, right? Um, I spent 20 years as a small business owner in the federal market. And since 2018, I've been teaching people like you that government contracting is not a secret. It's just a process. And a process goes A to Z. When you follow the process, you'll achieve predictable, uh, repeatable results. And that's what I want for you. That's why I do this teaching is so that you can start having that kind of predictable success down the road. Um, do me a favor. Before we get too far, uh, help buyers help me remember who you are. In the chat, put your company name core competency, use two or three words to say what your core competency is so it's easier for me to remember um, and other people to remember what you do, right? So go ahead and put that into the chat. Um, also keep in mind that uh, you know as you do this, if you've been here before and you've put your information in, there's people here who show up every day to training or watch the replays who haven't met you before. And so make sure you're putting it in uh, as a way that they can see. I'm looking at uh, Russell, Russ, for example, Pacific Business Services in Honolulu, uh, project scheduling and Hawaii build outs. That's pretty clear, right? Project scheduling. And I tie it back to construction because he said Hawaii build outs. Um, do, you know, whatever your version of that is, that's perfect. And I actually like that he threw in that he's in Honolulu because it gives us a little context of where across the country you are. Or for those of you who come in from Germany, <laughs> where across the world you are. Um, and then uh, one other thing to keep in mind about the chat is it's a community. You're meeting other people in there while you're listening to me give you today's training tip. You are able to meet other people uh, like Russ or Joan or Jim, and, um, and you can engage with them, right? And, and it doesn't always have to be engaging with somebody who does exactly what you do. Russ does is in the construction world and project scheduling, but um, he could be meeting people in other services like IT professional services or something, and you both might be in Hawaii well, by building a relationship, you know, you got friends. That's always good in business when we're working, um, in sales when we're working. But also maybe you're both going after the same agencies just for different reasons. So it's good to meet people in here. Uh, if you're open to connecting on LinkedIn, let people know that and they will reach out and connect with you. By the way, if you're here, if you're watching, if I see you, I'm thinking you're open to connecting with me and I'm going to reach out and connect with you. So um, I'm excited about uh uh, today's training. Oh, one last thing. I really want to say thank you to our supporting, uh, sustaining members of the GovCon Chamber of Commerce. Without you, we would not be able to keep doing this day after day. And so thank you very much. We definitely appreciate you. All right. So let's go ahead and dive into the training. Let me make sure my feed is off. 
Um, we're going to rock and roll. Today, I got a fire hose, again, worth of information to share with you. Uh, easily two or three days worth of content shoved into 25 minutes. Um, so let's get started on today's topic. I'm going to cover, um, in today's training, I want to talk about how to find and win your next federal contract, right? And I want to give you three tips along the lines of what do you do to find and win your next federal contract? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is is really understanding a specific niche and how important it is for buyers to be able to easily see and understand what you do, right? I told you to put two or three keywords. Um, num number two thing I want to talk to you about today is uh, the, uh, the action of reaching out to 10 people every single day, uh, letting them know your goals. And I'm going to expand on that, but this is uh, a measurable step that you can do. And if you do this, it will lead to that next federal contract. And then the third thing I'm going to talk about today, kind of wrap it up, is building a 100% winning proposal score for your top opportunities, right? Um, I'm not looking at your entire pipeline, but looking at your top opportunities, teaching you about briefly winning proposal scores. How do you define that? And I'm going to give you action items that you can take away, hopefully, uh, that will help you hopefully on your path to success. Okay, so let's get rocking and rolling with determining your specific niche. And when I talk about this, I'm saying you want to determine a niche, something you do and your company can be known for so that it's easy for buyers to know what you do. I said, put your company name and core competency into the chat with two or three words. Those two or three words are basically your niche, right? And when I start seeing it, uh, like right there, I'm looking at Dr. Amit, uh, uh, data and artificial intelligence, right? When I start seeing that, um, I instantly can kind of see what he does and understand I'm like, oh, OK, you do AI and uh, machine learning or data. I get it. You fit here. You're not construction. You're not manufacturing or or training your artificial intelligence. Got it. Uh, and so you want people to be able to see, uh, meaning quickly they look at your material, they hear it from you and they can instantly go, ah, got it. Artificial intelligence. Got it. Project scheduling. Um, I'm looking into, I was looking for a couple other examples there, but anyways, to see it and understand when they understand they're able to uh, help you. If I can't understand what you do, I'll feel a little uh, embarrassed or anxious or confused. I'll move away saying, I really want to help Johnny, but I don't know what he does or something. I'll get back to that. But if I see it and I can understand it and I know what these other people in my office do in my agency that, that I'm willing to to help, or I'm willing to talk to you more to see if I can help. Um, so it's not enough to say that uh, you do cybersecurity or construction. Let me give you an example of how to niche down, right? If you do cybersecurity, there's all sorts of type of uh, specialties you can have in cybersecurity. Think about law. There's all sorts of specialties in law. You might be a tax lawyer. You might be a, a government contracting lawyer. I met somebody yesterday who all they focus on is government contracting. You might be constitutional law. You might be a defense lawyer, right? There's all these different parts of law. So you're not legal. You're not cybersecurity, right? Cybersecurity is that same kind of way. Saying I do construction, same thing. It's really big bucket type terms. You want to niche down. Um, and an example of cybersecurity is you can niche down to zero trust. That is a very specific uh, part or piece of cybersecurity that you can talk to. And it gets you in the door. People can see and understand that. Plus, it's a buzzwordy thing. They understand it. If you're construction, niching down might be painting, right? My company does painting. Perfect, right? You could even say we do internal painting or indoor painting compared to outdoor painting. Um, we do environmental friendly painting, whatever it is. But you're sitting at painting is a lot lower down than um, uh, current construction. And so by doing that, you've niched down. Have you done that, right? Can you see your uh, core competencies at the construction level or at the painting level? Think about whatever your services are. Um, second thing I wanted to point out as it relates to uh, determining a specific niche is that we often feel, and you might feel the same thing, uh, FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, and, and I think that FOMO is what holds us back sometimes from finding what I call slam dunk opportunities. Slam dunk opportunities are as if the government wrote it specifically for you. You know, we need somebody who can paint our walls inside buildings and has experience doing it. Oh my gosh, that's what we do. We, we've done it over and over again for your agency. You know, here we come. Um, or I've done it on the commercial side. We can do it here. Uh, you look at it and you go, that's a slam dunk. Slam dunk is a basketball reference, by the way. Somebody running up to the, uh, the net and jumping up and slamming the ball in compared to shooting it in, right? So a slam dunk opportunity is what you want. 
Um, you don't want it bouncing off the rim or missing it or all this kind of stuff. You want to hold that ball all the way up into the basket, poof, slam dunk. And when you slam dunk your opportunities, these are opportunities that are aligned to that niche, right? That painting or zero trust uh, type niche. But when you have FOMO, you worry about if I'm saying painting, I'm going to miss out on um, flooring or I'm going to miss out on elevator service or some of these other things, right? And it's okay if you've got a couple of extra words. Don't, don't read too much of that. But if you get too, you like you're doing too many things, it's harder for people to focus on you and help you because you're um, because they're they're seeing too many uh, you know rabbits or whatever. They're seeing too many things and they're getting confused. But if you niche it down, they understand this is what you do. They see it and understand it, and they begin to help you. Once you're in, remember that FOMO. Once you're in and the customer's happy, you can say, hey, by the way, we don't just do painting. We also do. Um, road paving, we do curb maintenance, we do, uh, you know, bathroom facility maintenance or whatever. Now you're in with a contracting officer. Now you're in with a customer. You can talk about all these things you do because they trust you. They know, like, and trust you. But niching down allows you to find those slam dunk opportunities. So um, the third thing is uh, on, on determining your niche is when you have a niche, you want to plan your marketing activities around your niche. Don't talk about everything. Um, in particular, I'm thinking about LinkedIn and I'll give you a quick little story on that but be a reliable source of information. Um, when I write content for LinkedIn, it is almost always around uh, federal sales one way or another. Um, and it is always around federal government contracting. I do not write about the commercial side. I do not write about um, like unrelated stuff. I do not write about things that interest me outside of the, the niche that I'm trying to own, which is government contracting, right? A, a government contracting coach, if you will. Well, same thing for you, right? If you're a, uh, I've been watching actually Hunter, she's in our group and I've been watching her LinkedIn stuff and um, and I've, I'm loving it because she wants to sell into, her company wants to sell into the Navy and they are experts on Microsoft SharePoint. So Microsoft and SharePoint, um, and they wanna get, the, uh, get business with the Navy. So she has been engaging with some content uh, that the Navy's putting out. She's been putting it out herself, taking some Navy content, sharing it out saying, hey, this is awesome stuff. And she's been sharing out content from case studies that her company has done saying, hey, you know, if your agency is looking to do this, which I know the Navy is, we've done this over here. And it's it's all to me awesome stuff because it's talking about case studies around SharePoint. It's talking about tips around SharePoint. When the Navy buyer or market researcher, whoever is coming out, looking through the Internet, looking through LinkedIn, trying to find companies they can learn from because that's what they do. When they find Hunter, because she's consistently posting content that's related, um, they will begin to trust and maybe hit that bell notification that has her um, posts coming directly to their messaging or to their uh, LinkedIn notification. They will trust that she's a reliable source of information on SharePoint, right? That's where I go when I want to learn about SharePoint. And I know there's other SharePoint people in here, just uh, I, I work with Hunter and I, so I know it, but, and she does an awesome job at this. If you haven't, if you're not connected with her, connect with her. Um, so anyways, be that reliable source of information. When you're putting content out, be careful of talking about everything. Talk about zero trust. Talk about painting or elevators or training. Whatever your niche is, that's what you want to be talking about. And, and you're able to do that when you have that specific niche. So if you understand what I'm talking about there, do me a favor. In chat, put my niche is like one word or, or one phrase, right? My niche is, and niche is N-I-C-H-E. My niche is this, um, so that we know. Um, okay, so let me move on to the second bullet. Uh, in this one, where we're, uh, what I want to talk to you about is, now you know your niche and the things I just said about it, you need to reach out to 10 people a day to let them know your goal. I used to be trying to, I, I used to try to be soft about this and say, oh, I'll do two or three, but that's crazy. If you want to grow your company, if you're a salesperson or a business owner and you're trying to grow your company, then you need to dedicate time every single day, not some days, Every single day, you need to dedicate time to sales activities, business development activities in particular, which are the things that um, lead to new opportunities coming into your pipeline, right? You're always going to work on capture, which is uh, basically trying to shape an opportunity, proposal writing, uh, serving the customer, taking care of employees or colleagues, right? You're always going to have to do that stuff. But all of that stuff is in what I call quadrant one. It's important and it's urgent. But um, this 30 minutes a day, an hour a day, even if you just do that um, every single day, 
in business development, reaching out to 10 new people every day. When you do that, you're in quadrant two and go watch other training to understand what I'm talking about here or Gus will give you a link. But when you're in quadrant two, then you wanna put, um, uh, you wanna, you're focusing on important things that are not urgent, but you're working on your future. So let's talk about um, what you look at. Sales, like I said, has to be an everyday activity, right? Um, it can't be an afterthought. If it's an afterthought, it will not get done. So block out some time. It's called time blocking, right? 30 minutes a day if you're not doing it at all. An hour a day is where I really want you to be just for this activity of calling 10 people a day. You're picking up the phone and you're calling 10 new people a day, right? We work with a customer and just uh, yesterday, the day before, it gave them a list of almost 200 people. These are legitimate uh, people that I think are good ones to call, names, numbers, and emails. And now she's just going over the next few months of uh, 10 people a day calling and reaching out. And even if you get a meeting, that doesn't count like the next day. You still want to call 10 people a day until you hit whatever your goals are. Um, uh, in order to do this and to feel comfortable doing this, make sure that you have a, uh, a couple of tools in place, a voicemail script. Every time you call somebody, nine times out of 10, you're going to get the voicemail. So have a script, 30 seconds or less, that says exactly what you want. So there's consistency of your message. The second thing is um, a couple hours later, you want to follow up with an email saying, I left a voicemail. Here's an email. That email should be templatized. Um, you should uh, customize it to the person you called with just their name. But otherwise, it's, excuse me, it's just saying, hey, I, I left a voicemail, following up on email, like I said, love to get an intro call. Um, and then the third thing that you want are a few bullets written down. I have a whole training on call planning, but basically you want a few bullets written down that if somebody answers the phone, you can be prepared to talk to them. And generally what you want to do is to schedule another meeting. When you're calling people for the very first time, I'm always trying to schedule an, an intro call a different day. I don't want to talk to them today. I want to talk to them a different day. And so those bullets around, hey, I just want to schedule an intro call. You know, we do this, this. What's a good time to get on your calendar? Um, but by having those tools in place, a voicemail script, an email template for follow-up, and a few bullets to talk to if they answer the phone, um, that'll make it easy for you to make these 10 calls a day and to just go through the rhythm. So uh, you want to communicate. Um, when I say reach out to 10 people a day, right, and let them know your goal, you want to communicate with them uh, what your niche is, right? We're saying what your niche is and then what your goal is. So an example is my niche is SharePoint, just going with that theme. My niche is SharePoint. My goal is that I'm trying to meet someone from PEO Digital. Uh, if you've looked at this uh, whole org chart that we've built, uh, for our customers, right? Inside of there, I can find the PEOs, PEO Digital. It's, it stands for Program Executive Office. So PEO Digital, underneath it, I can find um, technical focus areas. And under there, I can see their SharePoint. And I know that this is where SharePoint's being done, but I don't know anybody there. So the reason I'm reaching out is to try to you know, get access. That might be something that you can do, but you want to communicate pretty quickly and clearly. This is my niche. And um, this goes back to the FOMO thing for one second. I'm okay if I communicate my niche and they say, well, that's not me. Perfect. Let me move on. Right. Cause some people will want to talk to you. Some people will be helpful. Some won't. So what, right. You just move on. So some will, some won't. So what, um, that's just sales. So if you understand what I'm talking about, reaching out to 10 people a day and letting them know that, uh, your niche and your goal and trying to set up intro calls, do me a favor in the chat, put 10 calls a day, 10 calls a day into the chat. Um, there's somebody right there. My niche is cybersecurity, right? Very clear. It's like, okay, I'm interested in cybersecurity. Let's talk more um, later. Okay, let's talk about the third bullet after I drink a quick sip of water. Okay, so um, we're cruising on through to the third tip. And this one, so let me just back up, make sure I'm lining up the first two tips and going to the third for how to find and win your next contract, right? Your next federal contract. It's not like you go in and bid. I'm not that guy, right? You don't, you don't just bid and win. It, you, you win it by doing the work. Um, so the three tips are uh, begin with that specific niche that makes it easy for them to see and understand you. When you have that, then reach out to 10 people a day and you should be aiming for 100 or 200 people that you're reaching out to day after, you know, through the days going forward. So reach out to 10 people a day, letting them know that niche and your goal you know, where in the agency maybe you're trying to get help to, to reach. And then the third one I want to talk about is building a 100% winning proposal score for your top opportunities. And um, just quickly giving you a differentiator between winning proposal scores and 
um, P wins is what it's called, probability of win. I've never ever liked the term probability of win because I feel like it, people misunderstand what it means. First off, they just kind of guess that number. It's not calculated for most organizations. And then the second thing is probability of win means in my mind, how many people submitted a proposal? My probability of winning is one by that number or whatever, right? So four people did it. My probability of winning is 25%. It doesn't matter what number I put there. My probability is 25% unless one of them gets knocked out. And then miraculously, my P win goes to 30%. I like winning proposal score because it it's just clear. It still is kind of the same realm, but it's clearer. And for me, it aligns to capture activities that you're doing. And I want to talk about um, a few of these, right? So uh, one thing is I said early on, when you have a captured pipeline, don't try to go after everything. Look in there and go, what are truly our slam dunk opportunities? We might have other stuff that are in there because our pipeline is not as clean as it could be, but what are your slam dunk opportunities? Pick the top four. Those four are the ones I want you to just push hard on getting a 100% you know, winning proposal score. And the way you get 100% winning proposal score, and I have a whole nother training on winning proposal score, but you have a set of criteria that you're applying to that opportunity saying, have we done this, done this? An example might be, do we have the past performance, right? Do we have the right team? Um, have we talked to the contracting officer? Have we talked to the program officer? Every one of those little tasks, in my opinion, begin to add up the P win or the winning proposal score because I'm able to get more and more information about challenges, objectives, et cetera. Anyways, so um, as you go forward, you just wanna focus on four opportunities. If you try to do this everywhere, you won't do it as well anywhere. But if you focus on four, especially if you've got a couple of people, then you're really measuring those successes. And as you move forward, you can put in place systems that allow you to scale. Um, but the first step in having a winning proposal score or the one phase of it is shaping the acquisition details. And so uh, shaping acquisition details begins with things like what contract vehicle is it coming out on, right? If it's coming out on a contract vehicle you don't have access for, then you're never going to get 100% winning uh, proposal score. In fact, you're not going to be able to do anything but sub. Um, yeah, but also if it goes out on a contract vehicle that you have, but it's not as good as this other one because this contract vehicle tends to have lower rates and this one has higher rates or something. You know, you need to look at that. This is shaping the acquisition details. Is it a set aside, right? Is it going full and open, small, woman owned, right? The lower that set aside you can make it, the more of your competition you're pushing away. Um, if you can get it down to be an SDBO set aside and you're an SDBO, then you're giving yourself additional points for having a winning proposal score, right? The winning proposal score to me, by the way, isn't all about the proposal. It's about the capture activity that goes into the proposal um, as well, right? So then uh, shaping acquisition details, right? You might think about the, um, uh, the NAICS code. You might think about certifications. For example, does it need ISO's uh, 20, 27001 certification or CMMI level three? If you're only a CMMI level two, then push it down to level two. But what if it's only uh, when the when the requirements being shaped, if you can get them to see the value of CMMI level three, because you're at CMMI level three, well, now you're you're shaping that acquisition, some of the acquisition based decisions that are in there. Um, these are the, just company certifications. That's why I say it's acquisition details. But so there's those kind of details. The second way, the second phase of shaping the winning proposal is to look at the scope of the work, um, beginning to shape that opportunity. Too often, we pursue opportunities that are basically dropping, right? The request for proposal is coming out and, and we're looking at it. Um, if we're a little more advanced, we're, we're seeing it when the RFI is dropping. What often happens is people look into things like GovWin, dump all the data from GovWin into the pipeline and act like they're doing any kind of capture. You're not, you just transferred from one data source to another data source, your tools, right? But capture is about having conversations inside the customer's uh, office with them, with the contracting officer to shape acquisition details, right? With the small business specialist to learn any inside information you can that could be helpful to you understanding what um, they, they're looking for, discussions, items that might not be on the paper. And then talking with the program office, not just talking to them about what are your needs, what are your goals, and what are your challenges, but also uh, ways you begin to improve your winning proposal score is to start talking with them truly about, hey, this is what we were thinking the solution was going to be. We were thinking we were going to build a knowledge-based system for you on 
uh, SharePoint and it could be the best and we've got all sorts of SharePoint experience and they look at you and say, well, that's awesome, sounds awesome. Yeah, we're an Oracle shop. We're gonna build it on Oracle. Uh, that's really what we're gonna look for. Well, that immediately tells you, okay, I'm out of here. It was a slam dunk, but I just figured it out. Or um, if you can get them to see that they're thinking, well, we were gonna get a proprietary system, you might be able to shape this. And I've done this in my business before. You shape their thinking into, hey, you should think about putting it on SharePoint because you already own SharePoint. SharePoint is this application development platform. I can build a system on there and reduce the overall cost to you by 50 plus percent because you don't have to buy the new tool, the new software and the hardware that goes with it. You don't have to bring in trained people to just maintain the, the base system in order to put a knowledge-based system on it, right? So you're in there with the program office trying to shape the scope, their way of thinking about it. That's truly what an RFI is, by the way, a request for information is the, uh, the government trying to have a dialogue with industry about what might be the things we should think about going forward as it relates to requirements. So the last one is shaping the team. Um, you wanna make sure that when you're thinking about a winning proposal score, you wanna have a team. It takes a little time for small businesses to come to the realization that you are way more powerful um, having 20% or 40% of, of an opportunity than 100% of an opportunity. 100% of an opportunity puts it all on you. But if you have a team, let's say there's an opportunity that's slam dunk for you, but slam dunk on six of seven opportunity or task areas, you can shape your teammate to come in and uh, fill out that task area. Or maybe you cover all seven areas, but you're doing it in the Department of Homeland Security, but this opportunity is in the Navy. Well, add somebody to your team that brings that Navy experience. So we bring, you bring the subject matter expertise and past performance outside the agency. And our teaming partner brings in um, the experience in your agency. I use a teaming worksheet when I'm doing this. What do we need from the team to be able to strengthen the opportunity? All these things, shaping the acquisition details, shaping the scope details, and building that team, shaping the team, um, all of those lead to a strong winning proposal score that you can control, right? It's not subjective on how many people are responding to an opportunity, but you know that your proposal when you submit it is a winning proposal. It's up to the government to decide whether they award it to you, but you know they will be impressed and appreciate it. So if you understand what I'm talking about, put shape to win into the chat. Shape to win. Okay, so in this training, I talked about finding and winning your next contract. Uh, your chances for success are going to drastically improve and increase when you identify a clear niche, when you reach out to 10 people per day, and um, when you focus on having a high winning proposal score, right? When you do those three things, you're going to see um, your chances for winning go increase. You'll also be able to start identifying, finding, and winning um, more contracts, in particular, your next contract. So go ahead and do that. Hey, if you found value in today's training, uh, do me a favor, become a sustaining member of the GovCon Chamber of Commerce. One other thing I just wanna let you know is we've got a workshop that we do uh, every few months and it's a BD process workshop. I only work with four companies in this workshop because it's where we come in, everything we teach, we come in and kind of do it with these four companies to constantly be proving out the process. Um, we've had a lot of success before and we're starting a new cohort. If that's something you're interested in, go check out bdinabox.com. There's a link coming into the chat probably. Just check it out if that's something you're interested in. This is for companies that are, uh, you got some traction already and you're looking to go to the next level. We can ac accelerate you in there. So hopefully uh, you'll go check it out if you're interested. Remember, government contracting, it is not a secret. It's just a process. I'll see you in the next training.